Amen. Welcome to uh, Win First Church of the Nazarene. And this morning we are celebrating and we say, He is risen. He is risen Amen. If you believe that, stand with us and sing. be seated. Well, I know she's already said it, but I just want to say it again because that's what I do. He is risen! risen And I want to add to it, if you don't know me by now, I'm I'm a guy that has a fit every once in a while. So when I think about my Jesus that is risen, I want to have a fit. How do I have a fit, church? Woo! So... Let's, let's add to that this morning. I'm going to get your spiritual juices flowing. So when I say He is risen, you say He is risen indeed, and all together we will have a fit together. Will you have a fit with me? 
All right, he is risen. He is risen Woo! I don't think we've ever done that before. It's pretty cool. That might be a new that might be a new tradition in the Church of the Nazarene. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to see each every one of you this morning. Boy, did we have a good breakfast this morning. And uh, I don't know, that should probably be against the rules for preachers to eat before they sing in a cantata and preach the Word of God. I'm already winded, and I haven't done the first thing. But uh, anyways, good to see each and every one of you this morning. I don't know about you, but I just came to worship the Lord this morning. And uh, when we do that, something happens. Amen. Something happens in our spirits, and He ministers to us. And is it okay if I give Him permission to just crowd in on us today as we worship Him? Well, just a couple announcements I do want to get out of the way this morning. Um, yeah, I hope you did get a win former. Um, I know we have some extra visitors with us this morning. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we would love to have you just tear off that little section, just a little information card. That way we can get to know you just a little bit better. And uh, this, this evening, or this evening, yeah, we're going to dis dismiss the service this evening. I'm preaching till 7 o'clock tonight. How about we just say sometime before noon? Is that good? All right. On your way out, there will be uh, some ushers with the offering plates. Uh, you can drop your offerings on the way out. And also, if you fill out one of these cards, we would love for you to drop that in the plate just so we can get to know you. Uh, there is an insert and there's a sign up as well. But picnic time, Sunday, April 23rd. Youth, girls, and women picnic and camp after church, more after morning worship. Uh, ladies and young ladies, bring your lunch and join us outside in the youth area for games, crafts, fun. All youth, all youth girls, sixth grade and up, and ladies of all ages. It's going to be a great time of fellowship for all the ladies of the church. So make sure you uh, yeah, sign up for that, ladies. With that said, uh, I, think, uh, I think we should just uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning, Lord, so thankful and so grateful that we can gather like we do each and every Sunday, but Lord, there's always just that extra emphasis on this particular Sunday. Lord, uh, I consider this to be the Super Bowl for your people's worship, Father, because we are celebrating the greatest victory that has ever been won in the history of mankind, and it was a victory that was won on our behalf, and that's why we celebrate. So, Lord, this morning we begin this service by not only thanking you for our blessings, but thanking you for the biggest blessing of all, and that is your son Jesus in our lives and for the difference that he made today. Father, we're just so thankful for our salvation. What a precious gift you've given us. So, Lord, as we worship today, we want the emphasis to be all about you and your son and what you did for each one of us. So we give you thanks and we give you praise. Now, Lord, we ask. Uh, that you just crowd in on us today and that we experience your presence in a very special and a very powerful way. Lord, we just love you, we praise you, and we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus, your Son, and all God's people say together, Amen. Amen. All right, uh, next order of business. Uh, we are a, a denomination that believes in missions, and uh, our church is no different than most Nazarene churches. We'd love to uh, aid our missionaries, help our missionaries. And one of the ways that we do that for you visitors is we allow our young people to come up and grab these cups up here. And what they will do is they will come mug you for all of your loose change. And all that loose change goes directly to the mission field so that we can help our missions uh, near and abroad. So kids, if you are ready to go shake everybody down for loose change, go get them.
Messiah, Emmanuel, Light of the World, King of Kings and Risen Lord. This is the story of Easter. Jesus is alive. That's the reason we come once again, like each Easter before, and rehearse the story of the cross. Once again, we follow the scripture as it takes us from the upper room where Jesus met with his disciples, to the Garden of Gethsemane, to Pilate's Hall, down the Via Dolorosa, all the way to the foot of Golgotha. And why do we choose to relive such pain and agony? Because in his suffering, we are reminded again of his sacrifice. In his death, we are given life. And only by the shedding of his blood can our sins be forgiven. It's not cathedrals. It's not steeples. It's not crosses made of gold. It's not just sentimental stories that have been passed down from old. It's not religion or tradition that can save the souls of men. It took the sinless blood of one holy man.
Who are we, Lord, that you stood in our place, that you let your heart and your body be broken for us, that your blood spilled on our behalf? Our hearts cry out with thankfulness, and we raise our voices in a grateful hallelujah. Oh, what compassion you showed. Oh, what love you displayed. Oh, what a savior you are. Christ came as a baby, lived a sinless life, and died on a cross between two thieves. If that had been the end of the story, our hope would have been forever buried in the tomb where they laid his body. But early in the morning on the third day, a song of praise echoed from the barren walls of an empty tomb. He is risen! He is risen indeed! Thank you. 
Whew, we've been on a journey there. Hey, Diane, would you join us up here on stage? This was a, a, a big project, especially for Diane to undertake with uh, Max's health and everything that's going on. For those, just an update on Max. Max has now been moved uh, to rehab. And as Diane said, it's probably a good time for him to be in rehab because their house had to be worked on. They ripped out the floor, jacking up the, the house and all this stuff to rework a bunch of things. And Max does not like change. So she's thankful that his health's getting better, but thankful he's away from the house. But, uh, but Diane, we wanted to present you with just a little gift from the choir here for sharing your gift with us and leading us and putting up with us. Just say that we love you. Are we thankful for Diane? And real quick, you guys did not get the view that we got, okay? For those of us in the choir, we got to see a lady who loves Jesus. And um, she spends practices crying through the practice um, because she's so moved by the words and the message that's within it. And just watching you, we celebrate with you. And, and it's what we're all celebrating today is our risen Savior. So thank you guys for all that you've done. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. He said, don't be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. The conqueror, victorious king, and lord over every living thing. They tried to reject him, but he couldn't be ignored. They tried to take him out, but he couldn't be defeated. They said he was dead, but they didn't know the ending. Mighty Savior, he reigns forever. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. So if you guys can um, stand with us as we sing these next two songs, I think you have it in you. If you can just stand for a few minutes and let's worship and be thankful and grateful that he is alive. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men who my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed, living me, loved me, dying he saved. Stretch. 
stretched out on a tree and took the nails for me. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. Breathing forever. One day, he's coming for the glorious day. Oh, glorious day. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep. For rising again, living he loved me, dying he saved me, and buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified, freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious. stars they wept the morning sun was dead the savior of the world was fallen his body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in 
Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there. And they said, where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Yeah. Well, you know, I, I get the I get the blessing and the pleasure of being able to stand before you each and every week and uh, proclaiming the good news of the gospel message, the the good news that we find from the front cover to the back by or the front back cover. Of God's Word. And uh, I consider that great joy. I considered it a great blessing. I consider it a great honor. But I got to tell you, when I, when I preach 
sunrise, not sunrise, I didn't preach sunrise, we let Mark do that this morning, which by the way, Mark did a wonderful job for his first ever preaching event. He only made one mistake, he bragged on Penn State, and so he still, I still got to mentor him a little bit further in his preaching style, and, uh, but anyways, getting to gather together on Resurrection Sunday for the believer is always just a all an event. It's just a regular Sunday on steroids. Amen. And it's it's crazy Pastor Dave getting even crazier. Now, you probably think this stage is clear for the choir, right? You're probably thinking I'm going to do the worm, right? Well, that ain't going to happen. It is just because the choir was up here. I ain't going to I don't think I'm going to do anything crazy today, but you know me, I get a little bit jacked up when I uh, preach Easter, Easter service because it's a, it's a wonderful um, event because it's the epitome of God's good news to each one of us. Uh, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 8, and as you're turning there, I just want to take care of one item of business real quick. I just want to give a special thank you uh, to all of those who showed up this week, throughout the week, uh, various crews, various individuals to to spruce up the prayer garden, to spruce up the entire property. Uh, there was quite a team that worked from beginning of the week to the end of the week, getting things ready and getting things cleaned up. So can we give this group just a round of applause for their, for their hard work? Thankful for the group this morning that set up and cleaned up for breakfast. Uh, thankful for uh, the praise team for their work. Thankful for the choir. All those that participated gave up their Thursdays and Sundays to practice. And uh, as I said, I'm thankful for Mark uh, being able to preach the Word of God this morning. But let's look at this account in Matthew chapter 28. It's one of those typical Resurrection Sunday uh, type scriptures. And then we're going to go to a whole nother, a whole nother area that I never have preached on, uh, Easter, on an Easter morning. But Matthew chapter 28 verse 1 says, After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake in verse 2, it says, For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it, and his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. Verse 4 tells us that the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then quickly, then go quickly and tell the disciples he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Verse 8 tells us that the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. And I don't care which of the Gospels that you choose to read from uh, this type of account, but all I see contained within the account of the resurrection is a great power. And I see uh, a proof of something that Jesus had said, and we find it in Matthew chapter 8 when the angel proclaims, He is not here, He is risen, and I've highlighted this, just as He said. Now, I spent a great deal of time uh, preparing for this particular Sunday, and then the Lord did one of his late Saturday shakeups in my spirit, and he moved me to an another whole direction, and I started just zipping through my iPad as quick as I could last night, finding how many articles I could find on the cross. And I got to tell you, there is... Article, 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 article after article, devotion after devotion after devotion, study after study after study, theologian talking about, theologian talking about the cross. And then I decided, let's Google what I can find out about the tomb. And do you know, there's a whole lot less speaking about the tomb than there is the cross. Now, the cross is a very important symbol of our faith. Can we all agree on that? Because the cross represents something that was really supposed to be ours. It represents a, well, first of all, we see it as a tool of death. We see it as an instrument of death. We see it as the symbol of where Jesus hung on the cross, stood in our place, took all of our sin, 
all of our guilt, all of our shame on him in our place. And so we, we see that, and it's a symbol of our faith. And when I see the cross, honestly, I'm, a, I'm moved beyond words because I can't believe somebody would do that for me, first and foremost. And that's a very basic introductory thought to our faith journey that our sins have been paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ on a cross. But then i got to ask the question, why do we talk a whole lot less about the tomb? When to, to me, the tomb exhibits and examples a great, big, huge power. In fact, when we think about the tomb, I see that as the exclamation point on what Jesus said he came to do. And also not what he came to do, but also what was going to happen. Because the tomb represents something. It represents new life. See, Jesus was laid to rest. You know what I love about the fact that Jesus was laid to rest? It was just a temporary action. He was taking a Nazarene nap for a few days. But then on the third day, he arose from that Nazarene nap. And he didn't arise just on his own accord or his own power, but the power of the Holy Spirit entered that lifeless, cold, death tomb, dead tomb, and brought life to a lifeless body. Oh, there's so many different ways that we can go with that this morning. When you really think about the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I'm coming back. Jesus said, I will rise. And the angel proclaimed that when they went to that tomb. And I don't know about you, but I, I, I look at that whole text of, of Matthew chapter 28, just in those eight verses, and yes, we, we see, the, the, we see, we see um, this earthquake. We see an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven, rolled back the stone. We see that his appearance was like that of lightning. It's kind of like, how do I best example that? Well, it was like the first time my wife seen me. My appearance was like, wow. <laughs> and my wife said, you notice I didn't get an amen on that? <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Dan, would you have amen me on I that? Almost did. You almost did. <laughs> but then you thought better of it. But this is an appearance like lightning. And can you imagine being just in the vicinity of God's physical presence, being in the vicinity would be almost too overwhelming. So an angel of the Lord, created by the Lord, serving the Lord, came down to proclaim the message, and his appearance was like that of lightning. Just curiosity, anybody in this room been struck by lightning? If you have, I'd love to hear your testimony. So before next Easter, I need a volunteer to stand out in this yard with a big steel rod over their head. Okay, Remy volunteered right away. How many of you vote Remy to get struck by lightning this year? Remy? We at least got two-thirds majority vote. And his mother's over here going, do you know why Courtney's over here going? Because he would do it. <laughs> Am I right? Absolutely. But we see this, this power that is exhibited, but for some odd reason, well, it's not odd, it's God, but this year my mind just went to the simple words of just as he said. Verse 6, go back to it. The angel says, he's not here, he is risen just as he said. Let's jump to another text here real quick. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 11. And I was going to use two verses, but I think we need to go back earlier into this conversation between Jesus and Lazarus's, Lazarus' sister. While you're turning, that gives me a chance to get a drink here. There is a key phrase used in this conversation. So John chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. 
This Mary, whose brother was Lazarus, now lay sick and was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to, the Lord, to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Verse 4 says, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that, God, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he learned that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered in verse 9, are there not 12 hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus <clears throat> has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will, not get be he will get better. Jesus, Jesus had been speaking of the death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he plainly, they told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Catch that. Lazarus is dead, Jesus said. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Verse 16, then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Can I ask you a question this morning, church? Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? This is a, this is a belief crisis for many trying to realize and, or even fathom what it must look like for somebody to come back to life, but this is something that I can't physically prove myself with just my words this morning, but I have invested my life and my faith in a belief that a man came back to life in a lifeless tomb. To those that are perishing, that's kind of a foolish message. But to us, it's new life. To us, it's a blessing. To me, it satisfies my very soul. One of my favorite songs written by Bill and Gloria Gaither, Because He Lives. I don't know if you're one of those people that looks at the story behind a song, but let me share the story behind that song. In the late 1960s, while expecting their third child, Bill and Gloria Gaither were going through a rather traumatic time in their lives. Bill was recovering his strength from a horrible bout with mononucleosis. They, along with their church, were the objects of accusation and belittlement, lies, and rumors. Gloria was experiencing a terrible time of torment, including the fear of the future and of bringing children into such a crazy, chaotic, mixed-up world. By the way, that was a long time ago, 1960s. <laughs> Times are always crazy, amen? As Gloria sat around and sat alone in this darkened room, she was tormented, she was filled with fear, but the Lord Jesus sent a calm and peace, a peaceful rest to her. The power of the resurrection story of Jesus Christ seemed to affirm itself in their lives once again. Gloria remembers the realization that it was life conquering death in the regularity of my day. The joy seemed to overcome and take precedent over frightening human circumstances. This is what Gloria writes. I am a wife and a mother. It was in the middle of the upheaval of the 60s that we were expecting our third baby. The drug culture was in full swing. 
existential thought had obviously saturated every area of our American thought and culture. The cities were seething with racial tension, and the God is dead pronouncement had giggled its way through all of our educational systems. On the personal front, Bill and I were going through one of the most difficult times in our lives. Bill had been discouraged and physically exhausted by a bout with mononucleosis. And in that weakened condition, he had little to no reserve to fight the psychological battle that was brought on by many external family problems. Someone whom we had cared about a great deal had hurled accusations at us at the fellowship of believers and at the whole idea of the existence of God. It was on New Year's Eve that I sat alone in the darkness and quiet of our living room thinking about the world and our country and Bill's discouragement and the family problems and about our baby that was yet unborn. Who in their right mind would bring a, a child into a world like this, I thought. The world is so evil. Influences beyond our control are so strong. What will happen to this child? I can't quite explain what happened at that moment, she writes. But suddenly I felt released from it all. The panic that had begun to build inside was greatly dispelled by a reassuring presence that engulfed my life and drew all of my attention. Gradually, she writes, the fear left and the joy began to return. I knew that I could not, I could not have that baby and face the future with optimism and trust. It was the resurrection itself that affirmed itself in our lives once again. It was life conquering death in the regularity of my day. And then these words were penned down. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. I love the end of verse 1. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. She goes on to write these other verses. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Verse 3, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives. And then the last verse. And then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know he lives. See, there was so much uncertainty in their life at that time. So much chaos surrounding them. So much hurt in their own personal context. But then they remembered the resurrection story that equals new life for the believer in Christ Jesus. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. I want us to look at one more verse. So we saw in John chapter 11 where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And we need to just rewind one chapter, verses 14 through 18. When Jesus is in this conversation, he says, I am the good shepherd. Not in that conversation. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Catch this next part. No one takes it from me, Jesus says but I lay it down of my own accord. And it gets better. He says, I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it back up again. This command I have received from my Father. So that verse, John chapter 10, 14 through 18, I, I want you to earmark that in your brain. Today, tomorrow, tomorrow, and how about you just do it the rest of the time on earth? The rest of the time that you are, you are sucking O2. Remember 
that Jesus has the authority. And this is a very key uh, text. Jesus is in control of his life. Jesus is in control of his death. And then Jesus is in control of his resurrection. Jesus has control over it all. And I got to tell you, if it wasn't for the sake knowing that you want to go be with your families and have a good meal and all that stuff, we could stay here all day talking about the many levels of this type of authority that Jesus has over death and life. But can I just encourage you with a few extra thoughts this morning before I send you on your pretty little Eastery way? Because y'all look so bright. Y'all look so bright this morning. Yes, my Savior lives. An empty grave is there to prove that he does live. One of the things that means is that death could not keep him. And if it couldn't keep him, and I am linked to him, that means death's not going to hold me down. See, I open this up with this thought about the, the symbol of the cross and the symbol of the tomb, and you've got to have both to make the story work. Amen? You've got to have both. To, you can't take out one or the other. Can I give a little side sermon real quick? We won't even ask for an extra offering. You can't take anything outside the Word of God. It's not your book to edit. Amen? Amen. I thought I'd get more amens on that. It's not your book to edit. But when I look at the symbol of the cross, that's a symbol of death, and I'm thankful that Jesus died for me. But have you ever had this thought that anybody could die? Some of you are, that's kind of a weird thought. Well... I read this amazing statistic that one out of every one person will die. It's a, it's, a, it's a guaranteed thing. Anybody can die, but not everybody can come back to life. Anybody can die, but not everybody can come back to life. But through Christ Jesus, there is always, always, always new life. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, and so will I, and so will you. Death couldn't hold him, and it could not keep him. An empty grave is there to prove, and this is my favorite one, that Satan loses. I got one, yep. Are you serious? This is Resurrection Sunday. I got one, yep, when I say, Satan loses. Thank you. An empty grave is there to prove that Satan is a moron. That should have got the best one yet. An empty grave is there to prove that Satan is a moron. He's an idiot. He's a bonehead. He knows He knows the power of God. If anybody knows the power of God, it's the one who was cast away from his presence. The one that used to be called the beautiful one. But he's a moron. You know how I know he's a moron? He has tried and he has tried and he has tried. And for three days he was running around like a happy clown because he thought he won. You know what he forgot to do? Size up his opponent. He forgot who he was dealing with. Amen? So, we should rewrite that song. An empty grave is there to prove that Satan's dumb. (laughs) Anyways. An empty grave is also there to prove there is power. An empty grave is there to prove that You have power, and that I have power, if I am in Christ Jesus. Let me leave you with a very simple truth. Right now, this very minute, the enemy is sizing you up. The enemy is sizing you up right now. 
He is sizing you up because he's ready to strike you once again. And I'm going to tell you right now, the closer that you try to get to Jesus, the enemy's going to come at you harder. So do not be shocked. Do not be dismayed. If you take a whole new, larger leap towards the Lord and you come under attack, the enemy is waiting. He's sizing you up just like he did Jesus. But can I tell you this? With what we looked at in the scripture this morning, there is no way the enemy can win if you are in Christ Jesus. You should not fear today and you should not fear tomorrow because if you are in Christ Jesus, you are living in this type of power. And this power is always victorious. Well, how do I know that? Well, the enemy's all about death and keeping people down. But my Lord and Savior, he's all about great big power. He's all about the resurrection power. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And you might spiritually, mentally, physically, uh, emotionally feel dead right now. But I'm here to tell you, you serve a risen Savior who's in the world today. And he was brought back to life. And if you feel dead today, you can find new life through Christ Jesus. And you can claim the victory. You know how I know that? Because the victory's already been won. Right. Jesus has authority over life and death. He has authority over the enemy. But if you are in him, you're already a winner. You've already won. Just stay with him. Just stay with him. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much. Lord, for who you are. Lord, for what you do. And Lord, we are thankful this morning that you are literally the constant in our life. We are thankful this morning that you never leave us, that you never forsake us. And Lord, I love those words that we looked at. You are the resurrection and the life. It was just four weeks ago in this very sanctuary that we saw a whole lot of new life. When we were here till almost one o'clock, living in a, a spirit of revival. Lord, this is what new life looks like when your people are just walking to you, running to you. Lord, I'm just so thankful for what you are doing in the lives of individuals. And Father, right now, maybe there be uh, somebody here today who is going through that physical, mental, spiritual, emotional struggle. Uh, and this battle just seems like it's never going to end and it just seems like they're never going to get out of it. But Lord, we see this morning that where you are, death comes to life. We find this morning that with you, there's always new life. We find this morning with you that there is always victory because you have defeated it all. So, Father, if there be somebody struggling here this morning, Father, I would, just, I would ask them just to slip their hand in the air so I can spend time praying for them. If you have that struggle, would you raise your hand so I can pray, pray for you this week? Spend some extra time over you. Lord, you see those hands, and I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that you would just infiltrate their spirit. Lord, that you would intercede on their behalf. Father, that they would just be completely overwhelmed and consumed by your presence and by your peace working in their midst. Father, I give you thanks for our church family. Lord, thankful for our guests and visitors today, Lord. And as we go together and we celebrate as families and uh, everything, Lord, I just pray that you would just bless each one's fellowship. And Father, as we go out into this world, may we be exactly who you called us to be, a people that are living in resurrection power. Father, let us be the source of joy. Let us be a source of hope to those around us. Lord, we just love you. We just praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody says together, Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for sharing your Sunday with us. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Yeah.